Hi, this is Ernie Altbacker, and you're listening to the FSF Popcast. The show that convinced Hal Jordan that the Green Lantern Corps could do humanity a favor and remove our show from existence. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon the Teen Foundation and helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Redshirt Crewman number 1960. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins the Justice League in their fight against the Legion of Doom, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope. Because the Redshirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of his cape. All right, guys, our guest today is an Emmy-nominated screenwriter, director, and producer who has worked for DC Animation and other animation studios for quite some time. You've seen his work in shows like DC's Injustice, Justice League Dark, Apocalypse War, Batman Hush, Teen Titans, The Judas Contract, and so, so many others. Uh, we are very proud to welcome Ernie Altbacker to the FSF Podcast. Welcome to the show, Ernie. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Ah, yeah. We're, we're honestly very excited to have you. We had a couple little snags getting the, the date right and being able to make this work, but we're so glad that you were patient with us and stuck around and and uh, we're willing to come back on the show. So You didn't give um, up on us. Yay! Fourth, fourth or fifth times a charm. <laughs> yeah, there was a couple reschedules in there for sure, but uh, so yeah, I'm glad we were able to make this work out. So, Ernie, you have written so many stories about characters in in the DC and other animation houses, uh, and some of them are origin stories as well. Now, we're all nerds on this side of the table, um, and we are we love origin stories, so that we always think those are very cool. But we also like to know the origin stories of our guests and i've said this before in other interviews since you are the hero of our story today oh. we would love to know the <laughs> the origin story of ernie altbacker and how was that written and how did we get here you know what were your influences along the way huh well lifetime comic book reader slash uh lover um I used to go to like the the Knights of Columbus. They had a small comic book show and I would rent a table. Like when I was 13 and 14 years old, mom would drop me off with like my several hundred comics. And mostly it was to see what everybody else had and trade up. And so I, I did that kind of for years and I was I was reading all this stuff. I'm a huge sci-fi fan. Um a huge, uh, you know, fantasy fan. When I was growing up, you could read the entire catalog of like fantasy and sci-fi books. You're like, well, I'm through all the Heinlands, right? I like, I've done it. I've read every Bradbury book, right? And now I got to get to this like really arcane stuff. You know, now there's just so much you can't, you can't really keep up with it. But before, True. if, if there was a, another person who, who was that type of nerd, you could just point to like, well, this is just like that Cordwainer Smith story, you know, <laughs> short story <laughs> from uh, 1937. And, and that person would go, you're right. <laughs> so we, we uh, you know, there was, there was just like, there was a lot fewer of us, right? I guess it kind of exploded to in, in the Dungeons and Dragons time, right? Where, where oh, it became, absolutely. yeah. Well, those guys are nerds, but they're kind of fun nerds, you know, or Star Trek, right? Um, so, of course, I went to college for business management and used none of that <laughs> um, and, and became a stockbroker. Uh, and after that flamed out, this was Wolf of Wall Street time, and my company was marginally better and worse, Right. So I was like, this isn't for me. And I started working on um, uh, working my dad's machine shop, which was good for the steady paycheck, but it is a machine shop. And, you know, it wasn't really my dream. So at that point, I was like, I got to do something on the side. And I toyed with writing the great American novel for about two days before I go, I really like movies. I should write screenplays. Ooh. And there was only okay. like, three books at the time of, of screenplay writing and uh so i i wrote a, i read those books i uh, you had to write away to actually get screenplays to samuel french and they would send it back to long island so i'm reading screenplays while i'm in the machine shop my father's like stop that right? you'll lose a finger right? <laughs> and um 
Okay, hand check. Oh, oh yeah. No, still got <laughs> no, we're good. Okay. We, just <laughs> we had well, this was one of the reasons I'm like, I got it, I gotta get out of here. We had a, a a machinist uh and his name was eight and a half. Not because he was a foreign movie fan, but because he had eight and a half fingers. <laughs> oh, like everybody's missing like a tip of a thumb or something or an eye. You know, there's a lot of hot metal. Um so <laughs> I got to change this up. So I wrote a screenplay and I got into the American Film Institute. And so nice. that basically got me over to this coast. I met um, Jim Krieg, who you probably know. He does a lot of these same mm -hmm. movies. He's my boss on a lot of these movies. But we were in film school together. I wrote some of his projects and that's why we work together. That's like the main relationship. But uh and there you go. Then you bounce from project to project and uh, and you get word of mouth stuff. But that's how I got from machinist, stockbroker, machinist in Long Island, New York to Los Angeles screenwriting. That's not the average journey that most people take. It is no. not. I'm sorry it took me so long to tell it. It, it seems <laughs> No, no, no. That was great. Are you sure? Okay. Oh, yeah. You can yeah. cut it. Cut it down to where I'm like, ah. you know, I started comic books and now I'm in that one. And now we I'm a like, writer. <laughs> we like the long-winded stories, though. We like the longer answers. And Tim usually says that it's the the longer you talk, the less likely it is that we're going to say something dumb. Oh, She's not the, wrong. But yeah. the more I talk, <laughs> I wrote of stupidity. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to use that line later. I walk a tightrope of stupidity. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> you yeah. that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I do. I need to put that on a t-shirt. Uh, uh, you know, it depends I, I... which side you fall off of. <laughs> it is stupid or if it's ignorant and enrages people, you know? That's mm. the tightrope. Yes. Which side do I fall off on? Yes. So, Ernie, along with you being, I mean, with you being a writer for screenplays, you've also got a series of books, Shark Wars, oh. which... Boy, you Currently guys done some research. Okay. We have. We, we try. try to pride ourselves on our research. So there are currently six in the series, and I haven't had a chance to dive into them yet because my daughter is currently still in a Dr. Seuss phase, which mm. is great until she's like, will you read Fox and Socks? I'm like, I'm going to bite my tongue off trying to read this story again. I can do this. It'll be okay. <laughs> so what is what inspired the series in particular, and what would you like the, our viewers and our listeners to know about it? Well... Shark Wars is, as, as some of the advertising says, is Star Wars under the waves. Um, so they, they asked me to do a, a take on how you would do like uh, uh, gangs of gangs of New York, you know, like a gangs of sharks type thing. Apparently they renamed all the groups of animals to cool things like a murder of crows, right? Mm -hmm. It used to just be a herd of everything, like a herd right. of rhinos. Now it's a crash of rhinos. So it is a shiver of sharks, right? And Ooh, so they cool. thought, hey, that's kind of cool, you know, snake, um, shark gangs. And so I was like, well, I want to do it bigger. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll take the, the, the Joseph Campbell's, you know, um, heroic journey, a mm -hmm. hero's journey, right? And also I want to do World War II with sharks, with like masked uh armadas of sharks doing the moves from stuff like the sword fighting in robert jordan's the wheel of time where they name each of the moves like they go he countered with boar rushes down a mountain you know right oh that's <laughs> cool like, yeah so so i was like i'm gonna i want to like create like triple tail turns down you know the cuttlefish strikes and uh, do these great like masked mass things and they were like yes do that and um so it's, it's it's really fun by the time i was writing book two they were like we we would like another trilogy they they, they asked for a trilogy at first and uh i guess i can talk about this now but one of the great disappointments for me is that i got optioned by netflix and um and i got very close to making that a show and oh god it would have been so fun it, it sounds like fun it would have been fun yeah but there was a court you know there's a corporate reaping and then your champion leaves mm -hmm. uh, 
and then all of a sudden a new person comes in who doesn't like it that much and then you're out on the street and now it's locked up forever with money against it and i'll never be able to do it (laughs) oh that sucks yeah it's too bad yeah that would have been that would have been fun to watch um it's it would be a good uh you know like baby's first epic I, I think right? it's kind yeah. of like a, a six to eleven type thing with real stakes, where some of the original group of sharks dies. So you have like the real stake introducing kids to death. Mm-hmm. Not that you, sh- not that you really should or need to in today's world, but you know, like, um, it's just my type of story. It's it's kind of like the Harry Potter storytelling. The first two books of Harry Potter are very much a children's book, and then all of a sudden it gets serious. You know, You're like, oh. What's happening here? Yeah, this Goblet of Fire murdering. is not a children's book. This Voldemort's murdering people, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> well, um, us nineties kids got exposed to death early, and we're fine. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're we're, we're totally fine. We only have a slight twitch. We're good. Yeah. No, I, I was thinking about it when you said that the, the first two Harry Potter books are kids' books, and I'm thinking about it with the yeah, Prisoner of Azkaban. Not so much Goblet of Fire when Cedric died. Nope. Nope, not a kid's book. Yeah, no, they really did some. some I mean, it, it, it's great. It's a great series. Oh goodness, I do love the the. It's a shiver of sharks talking about the the group of animals, because some of them are hilarious. Like I don't know why they have named some of the animals the way that they have. Ah, uh, right? yeah. But like the Congress of Baboons is one of my favorites. The Congress of Baboons. Yes. Yeah. And a parliament of owls. All right. Oh, so you know the namings. All I right. Do. I like the. Uh, I think the best. The 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 best one might be a slither of snakes. That's true. That one is Although really. The really crash good. of rhinos is pretty high. I, up. Crash of rhinos is really good. I I like shiver of sharks so much. I wrote I wrote it down. So. Nice. According to IMDb, it could be wrong. Uh, there are two movies coming out: Justice League War World and Dicks or Ducks. I think it's Dicks. <laughs> what can you tell us about these shows? Dicks is a story about two bumbling private eyes who turn out to be not bumbling private eyes, but more handler and amnesiac, uh, am- am- uh, uh, Jason Bourne. Okay. A killing spree. Uh, and that's a live action television pilot that we shot in hungary um okay being edited uh right now we're hoping i'm kind of getting ahead of myself but you know i can i can say this part because we're we're in charge of it we're trying to get a panel um at comic con to to show part of it and that we made it an hour-long live action pilot in hungary for like an absurdly low amount and the production quality of it is is very high (laughs) like other people should go do this with their with their low budget films like if you're doing a low budget horror you should probably go to hungary (laughs) to do it okay interesting because they have they have a lot of talent i mean one of the directors of photography his day job was being second ac on halo the stunt crew that we used was working on Dune 2. Oh, nice. Okay, so and then they came and did our stunts. So you can imagine, like, this is like, even though it's a low budget thing, it is like a high quality. I'm, I'm really, I'm really pleased with what I'm seeing so far. Awesome. awesome. That'll be really cool. Uh, with the same company, I'm hoping to, uh, uh, I, I've written a, a low budget horror film for them that they they hope to do maybe at the end of this year or once winter hits you don't want to shoot in the winter so you gotta wait for the spring so mm-hmm. or, fair yeah. enough yeah yeah but um it's it's a really fun place my parents are both hungarian i ha- i i finally did the paperwork so i i have a, a an eu passport i'm a dual citizen Awesome. So I can work in the EU and it, and it gets people points, you know, like I actually have a, an address and a bank account. Like it's not just the passport. So I can, I can nice. work those projects. And so that stuff is starting to come to me, which is exciting because 
it's more live action stuff, which, yeah. which which is tougher to get over here. So maybe it'll lead to me pitching live action stuff over here. But very cool. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, we also noticed, uh, Ernie, that a lot of the movies you've written for have established characters that when you talk about the characters, it, it, they, you know, fans have a, a prevalent picture or, or thought of them in their mind. Characters like, of course, Batman. There's, you know, you did some work with Scooby Doo. There's Teen Titans, Constantine, Green Lantern, you know, all these ones that have established universes and backlog stories and all these different things. So, I've asked this of, of other writers who have written for established characters, and I would like to get your take on this as well. All right. Do you find it easy or difficult to writing to write for existing characters, or do you prefer the confines of writing for existing characters, or do you find it find it to be you know to be a little more freeing? Well, you know, being a nerd like yourselves come on you, you, wouldn't you want to write for batman right oh sure <laughs> right? yeah true. And so <laughs> so yes there are there are some boxes that you have to stay in like batman doesn't go around murdering people right he has the mm -hmm. code you have to stay within those but there are um but you know batman's batman's like really the same uh in in a lot of iterations but in all the other characters, I find that depending upon depending upon the the actual movie or show, that their personalities do slide from side to side. Okay. Like Constantine in Justice League Dark is more serious, and you know that could be a live action movie. Whereas Constantine in Justice League Action is very comical right or mm -hmm. superhero squad you could do some something and and there it, it all depends on the age group that you're that you're going for um fair enough even, even with the even with the seriousness like the wonder woman um the wonder woman from uh justice league uh dark apocalypse war or or justice league dark is different than um injustice in Injustice, I wanted her to be more of a battlefield queen that was merciless. If you would go up against her in the battlefield, she will kill you. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no mercy there, right? right? Whereas in Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, it's more of what I think of as the, the Gal Gadot version. You know, okay. she's uh -huh. very honorable. If she cannot kill you, she will try to not kill you because maybe you can be reformed but uh, the injustice one will just chop your head off for being there, <laughs> there <you laughs> <It's go. like laughs> might not even let you surrender <laughs> all right well that's cool that's a that's a cool answer because you know I, I we have found that uh with other writers who are are writing in like the star wars universe or the star trek universe and and even some marvel writers is that they they too uh have had a very similar response in that they feel that that yes there are boxes but those are the known boxes and that those are the ones that like you were just saying yeah there are some certain boxes that you don't want to go outside of but there's freedom inside that inside the sandbox edges you know yeah. and that's kind of how it was brought out to me by other people and i kind of think that you were saying the same thing i mean absolutely you know and you can change them a, a little bit like the green lantern that was in the comics uh, who you know turned into parallax and destroyed Coast City mm -hmm. when we were or right before or you know, a couple of years before when we did Green Lantern the the um, animated series is far different than the one we did for the animated series. He's he's a he's more of a, a guy that you want to have a beer with. That's the life of the party, right? He's a little mm -hmm. bit a little bit not serious enough, and that was part of his arc to to take it more like he's he's not going to get by on everything with a with a jaunty grin and uh and and hold my beer let me do something crazy he's gotta get serious about it right whereas yeah. the other one is after he's killed all those people is is a little bit joyless for that reason you know for a for an excellent reason so 
I think that there's enough movement in them that you can, you know, does Batman find romance in yours? Do we see a soft <laughs> side of Batman that we kind of explore okay. a little bit, right? Uh, th- there's always new little nuggets that you can mine that I think makes it cool and fresh. Yeah, great answer. So kind of piggybacking off of Tim's question, because looking at the some of the stories, the DC ones in particular, that entire story was already written in another medium before being adapted to the screen. So what do you consider to be the pros and the cons of that kind of project where viewers might already know exactly where the story ends, or at least they think they do? Which story? Oh, man. Like all of them? or like any of them. Oh, okay. Well, uh, first of all, it, when you're adapting any, anything, uh, everything's too long. There's too much stuff. Even uh, Teen Titans, the Judas Contract, that was only four comics with one of them being a double issue and Mm -hmm. so you're looking at at that point they were like 22 23 pages you're looking at 100 pages of stuff we have 72 minutes right so stuff has to has to be has to be cut and trimmed Mm -hmm. to keep the narrative um the narrative drive flowing right so we had to cut the entire um what do you call it uh origin of of uh deathstroke to to fit it in there. So never mind Batman Hush, which is 12 issues. Right. right? So so we had to, uh, you know, so do you keep it? Do do you, uh, or or do you change it up because people have seen it? Um, You know, I, I like, I like keeping it mostly, but with Batman Hush, we had Mike Carlin in there and he was like, people knew immediately that it was the new guy. The new guy's in town and suddenly weird crap is happening, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's definitely that guy. And so um, uh, we had kind of come up with that. Why, why split the villain? Why not just make it the, the Riddler and the Lazarus pits mm-hmm. and, and, and kill off um, to Elliot, whatever, Tim Elliot, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> forgetting his name. Um, we kill off Dr. Dr. Elliot and it's real this time because everybody who read the comics is like, oh no, he's hush, he's coming back. And it's like, no, he isn't. So some people got very angry. Other people go, oh, you fixed it, right? So it's always uh, a kind of a, a balancing act. I, and I've got to say, I love the original, the Jeff Loeb and Jim, Jim Lee thing. I love it. We just couldn't, it should you know they should be doing a a 10 episode you know plus 44 minutes per episode do the entire thing right Mm -hmm. is what i'd like to see as a fan and a nerd right but Mm -hmm. home video doesn't do that home video has a parameter where there's 72 minutes and sometimes they get longer depending upon how much dialogue there is and you can scan and pan and the animation supervisors they can work their magic and sometimes they actually get three or four or seven more minutes in the budget if Warner Brothers deems it necessary or good, right? So you can never tell. That's why that's why they, a lot of them are just seventy two minutes. That's kind of your minimum, your your regular. And then I think the biggest one that I've seen is Apocalypse War, and that's ninety minutes or ninety two. And I can't mm-hmm. believe it's that long, but it it you know, it, James Tucker managed to. Jam, jam everything in there <laughs> uh, you know with the oh I'm, I'm doing a disservice to the director i'm forgetting his name but um but he's awesome <laughs> yeah fair enough from the the viewer side of it i don't really think about the where you have to make cuts and what you have to decide to change and it was just um yesterday we just had an interview with an actress and she mentioned that they were once handed a 54 page script for a 24 minute Disney show. Mm. And when she's like, well, why? It's like, so we have something to cut. It's like, that's too much. That's, that might be too much to cut. That's uh, a lot to cut. That's like three episodes worth of script. You just never, a lot of this is from, from marketing and, uh, um, you know, home video and marketing, what they think is, mm-hmm. is going to sell. So like with Injustice, 
They're like, here, do injustice. And th there's like a foot and a half of injustice stuff, right? And it goes yeah. up to year five. And I go, this should be three movies and, and you'll have sequels. And it's awesome. And they're like, we want one movie. That's all we're going to do. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's not really the writers. <laughs> like I'm like, okay, but now I'm, now I'm cherry picking. Right. right. Like, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, if there's only going to be one, I want to get the best scenes from everything. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think one day they'll do, you know, some sort of live action episodic or, or, or uh, animated episodic version of that. That's that will give them like six or eight hours with the episodes and they mm -hmm. can you know, right. really do it justice or injustice as it were. <laughs> See what I did. So you've written for several different DC characters throughout your career. Do you have a favorite DC group or character that you do like to write for for the most? John Constantine. He's my favorite. Batman's a close second. Um, but yeah, if I could do uh or oh, if I could do Marvel, I'd love to do some Wolverine. Um, or Deadpool, of course. Everybody would want to write. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to write Deadpool. Yeah, he's fun. He's fun. I um, do like that there was zero hesitation in your answer. <laughs> you know, because because a lot of guys when we when we ask them a question like that, instantly it's well, you know, you know, there's a little him and hawing, and they want to. They're all great, play. you know. Hal like Jordan great. too. I got to say, I've written a lot of Hal Jordan, and he's, right. I actually now I have like. I'd really like to do that. I have a Guy Gardner story that I would just kill to uh, to do. And um, because I think he's, he and John Constantine are actually close in that they're both assholes with a heart of gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John right. Constantine's admittedly jammed a lot deeper than, than Guy Gardner's, you know, because... Constantine is is just like he bears the weight of of keeping the gates to hell and evil plugged up. Mm. And if he has to toss his best friend to plug the dike to save everybody else, he'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> so usually it's written it's it's written where it's like that guy's a pretty bad guy anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Um I would write it that that guy's a saint and he has to do it anyway. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like just, and it tears him apart on the inside. And that's why he's just an ass. Mm. It's a bastard. Um, I always say that I'm a, I'm a, a, a jerk, but I'm an honest jerk. So, yeah. you know, so that, that, that has that in there, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. All right. Uh, so, with having been part of so many uh, amazing projects, and believe me when I say that DC animation holds a special place in all of our hearts over here, uh, you know, I grew up watching it, and then my kids grew up watching it, you know, with Justice League and, you know, all these type, type of things. Um, so there's a ton of work that you've done uh, to solidify your work in our nerd hearts over here. But is there a project that you worked on somewhere in the past that just didn't get the attention that you thought it should, that you thought it was really going to, you know, maybe have a uh, a launch that you just didn't get the the initial push that you that you'd hoped for. I would say, Green Lantern the animated series not getting its second season was mm -hmm. like, it was, it was, it was crushing, because we all feel everybody involved with that. I mean, I don't like to speak for Bruce Tim, <laughs> but, but I'll speak for John Carlo Volpe and Jim Krieg and, and the other people that are a uh, part of the directors, Sam Liu, Rick Morales, and all the super talented story, storyboard people. Um, that story that, that we did, um, in the in the two 13 episode seasons basically but it counts as one so 26 episodes i think it's you know among the finest shows that that i've written on so i i really i really love that show and i i wish i i think we could have done i think we could have done a lot more mm -hmm. that i hope they, i mean they brought back young justice 
Um, right. They have all those assets because it is a CG show. Mm -hmm. Could use the same look and go. I mean, like, look, I don't, I don't have to write on it. I'd love to watch it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to be in the room to, 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 to help out. We got plenty of ideas that, that didn't, you know, were put off to the second season. Um, but uh, boy, yeah, that, that, that one hurt. Yeah, I get that. I always felt like Green Lantern's one of the members of the Justice League that gets overlooked probably more than than the others. And mm -hmm. I've always felt that he isn't given his due justice uh, as <laughs> see what I did there, justice. Uh, but anyway, yeah. but I've always I've always thought he was an underappreciated member uh, of the Justice League, mm -hmm. whether, you know, um, whatever incantation of the Green Lantern you want to talk about. I think he just there's so many cool things that that the lanterns can do, you know, with that with that power ring, and and I've always just thought it was really, you know, especially when it came to the live action movie with Ryan Reynolds, that that was a whole thing, and yeah, it was a thing. <laughs> it was a it was a thing, um, and there's lots of there's lots of that movie that I enjoy, and there's lots of that movie that I think that they did right, but there's a lot of it where you go, yeah, that could have been that could have been done so much better. And, you know, but hey, uh, you know, you live, you learn. And I, I'm hoping that somewhere along the lines, somebody does the Green Lantern justice, whether it's, you know, I think the animated series and the, and the you know, that were done, I think they did it right. I think yeah. that, you know, uh, in the Justice League and how he was portrayed there, uh, I think those were done really well. I just, I want to see something more out of him. I want to, I would like to see a whole nother uh, series come back. You know, that's one of those things. I would love to see another Green Lantern series because we watched the Green Lantern series and we loved it. And, you know, my kids growing up, they loved the Green Lantern. They were running around the yard with their, you know, fortunately, they were far enough away that when they point their piss, their fist out at each other and say what they were creating, that they you know weren't hitting each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I would love to see I would love to see a a, a a Green Lantern series come back. I think in this day and age, it, it probably had would have a better reception than it may have back then, just because I think the nerd culture is stronger now than it was then. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as far as, again, the, a lot of this goes back to marketing and what they think they're going to make money on. So it's very Trinity centric. Sure. All right. Trinity, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, mm -hmm. right? Then the Understood. Justice League widens out to five, which includes the Flash and Green Lantern. Really, the one the one that's been really left behind is Aquaman, right? Because mm -hmm. that could be a, a great character. And then there's all those other Martian Manhunter and there's just a zillion great characters. Sure. Know, that uh, I think we had... We said something about this in the Green Lantern, but, but you know the the famous Neil Adams comic where hard traveling heroes we get a little bit of it. We change it to John Stewart and and Green Arrow, but it's like, what's Green Arrow doing in space? Right, right. <laughs> right? It's just a little like, wait a second. So he's shooting these wooden things. We, we've only got power rings. Right, <laughs> <Not> immediately dead. <laughs> right. So some of them you you've got to take with a little bit of um, you know, a, a, a little salt on it, and and just go with the ride. You know, when people hit anything in the fantasy comic book sci-fi world with a logic stick, it's going to go down. You know. Yeah. People, oh yeah. Yeah. I don't know if the physics of that will work, and I'm like. Oh, you mean in the thing with the magical Jedi people with lightsabers and space and all the hundred races? Stop that adding art? science to that my art? fantasy. Yeah, like I, I the person I had a personal couple with that uh, one I just loved. I got a, a letter for uh, of a Shark Wars fan, um, and uh, no, it wasn't a letter; it was a review. Um and, and it's probably still up there in either Goodreads or Amazon, where where it's like, my child loved this book, but sharks do not skid to a halt, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like so, it was the velocity and the turning thing that that 
that that had her in a tizzy, but and it was like two stars. And I'm like, your first sentence says, my kid loved this book, but you didn't enjoy the physics of the shark swimming, but you were all, all also okay with talking sharks. Right. The, the, like, the, the right. fact that they talked is fine. Shouldn't that be the issue that I'm not going to win the Cousteau Award? <laughs> sharks don't talk. Yeah, I don't get that one, but that's that's funny. I mean, it, it was great. They don't skid to a stop. I put that, yeah, I put I, I put that in the feed for a while. I'm like, this is the review right here. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. So I know that all of us here like to imagine the potential crossovers between different universes. Most famously, it seems to be Marvel versus DC, Star Trek versus Star Wars. Those don't necessarily have to be competitions always. Um, like the Scooby-Doo WWE crossover would be another good example so if you could orchestrate or, te- or orchestrate a team up or a contest between two characters or teams from any two different universes who would you pick and why Jeez. two different <laughs> teams um i want god this is a this is a hard question um <laughs> <laughs> I, so are are you my my crossover would probably be something like the god what's it called it's not the though the defiant ones like if you could chain together two people like um booster gold and darth vader and they had to do some obstacle course where they couldn't kill each other and i think booster gold would just drive vader nuts that would be and, and i would just watch the hell out of that you know <laughs> well, this is something something like that uh that would be really funny you know or um i mean you could bring the uh i can bring the star trek gang um into doctor who world right so they don't need their <laughs> they don't need the ship they're just got the tardis they're just I guess it's the same thing. That, Can you, you imagine, know, though? It really change. They don't Can need a Im- transporter anymore. They're just getting out of the... Hey, we're, we're here. I'm just trying to imagine Spock and his logic and the Doctor using his logic. Yes. But then getting right. mad at each other. Because there's not logic between while the While Kirk and Captain Jack are hitting on everything in sight. Like... I mean, it would be a good... You know, that would be a good... Uh, yeah, original cast with like a crazy doctor, like um oh David Tennant. Tennant. Matt, what's his name? Matt yeah. Smith. Matt, Matt Smith, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Oh, that would be fun. That'd be great. So we have a silly question. Uh, as because if, our other ones oh, have been oh so serious. <laughs> yeah. But we love food and we talk about it often with our guests. We talk about favorites, the unfavorites, and the in-betweens. But for you, what is the strangest thing you have ever eaten? Oh man, the strangest thing? I can you know, I, I, I wish I was gonna give you like some sort of um insects or monkey brains type thing, but um you know something that I really like and uh, uh, and people do find disgusting is tripe, which is the stomach lining. Mm. You know, um, it's it's kind of big and hungry. And uh, well, maybe this. Um, so when I was growing up in in Hungary, the snack when we when we wanted something, for some reason the sweets there weren't very good. I didn't like their cookies. You know, they're more like biscuits or mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and they would give you a uh, slice of bread with lard, salt, and paprika on it. But it was a lot of lard and a lot of salt. It was it was mm. just like you could feel your heart just go. Then you were off again. Yeah, it was just lard, salt, and paprika. Yeah, bread. No bread. Oh, a slice of bread. And then a, a thick layer of lard 
and uh, salt, like rock salt and, and paprika on it. Oof. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I could do that. You oh, I might go when try you it. were like 10, but I don't know if I could do it either. I, well, I don't know. With your cardiovascular history, Tim, you probably shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but die, I'm a die happy. Uh, I mean, bacon, please. It's be- better than you think. Better than it sounds. Okay. I would, I is would... it like? Is it toasted? Is it like toasted bread? Is it warm bread? Is it just warm bread or just bread? Just bread. No, but it's like Hungarian bread is potato bread. It's uh-huh. like really thick. Uh, oh, if you I would love potato out, bread. If you would scoop out the center of it, you could make this. Ball, mm-hmm. I would say it's like heavy bread mm-hmm. and it's delicious. I have had homemade Hungarian bread and it is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't we, had Hungarian bread, but I've had potato bread and I love potato bread. So I'm actually salivating right now thinking about it. There's a friend of my <laughs> a friend of my parents is Hungarian and he his wife used to make Hungarian bread for him and it was so good. Um, are very curious. It's delicious. So SD, yeah, no, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have a better and weirder answer. But no, I, you, answer. you had me at lard, so you know. I mean, any an, any answer that includes lard is lard sandwich. Strange. Lard sandwich is uh, yeah. I don't think they yeah. do it anymore. Even they, even even they have recognized we should do something about healthier snacks. We should probably stop eating lard. <laughs> That well, that sounds like something that's going to stick to your ribs. So I don't think you know if you're looking to get something that's going to, you know, put a little weight on, stick to your ribs. I think that's you. You go for the lard sandwich with what? paprika. Don't forget the paprika. So yeah, well, and you have to make the lard salt, taste good because they throw salt on everything. They don't taste any. They don't taste it first, but they throw more more salt in there. Every ah, uh-huh. fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. All right. Um, My mother-in-law must have Hungarian in her. Yeah. So. And uh, it, it's 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 quite good. You would, <laughs> we should have large go get together for large sandwiches. <laughs> uh, well, Ernie, thank you so much for being on our show today. Where can our guests go to or listeners go to find out more about you and your work? I am on Facebook and Twitter under my name, so at Ernie Altbacker. Um, and uh, I also have a LinkedIn under uh, under that, but uh, LinkedIn just like photos that uh, are like, oh, that's a good photo, you know, or I went to a concert, eh, whatever. Uh, but uh, upcoming projects and and things like that are more uh, on the Facebook and Twitter. So awesome. that Very will cool. always always say if some if something's coming out as more information comes out about War World. It will be at uh, on those two places, you know. Okay. We will definitely link your socials for people because we want them to be able to figure out stuff, find out stuff, do the research. It's fun. Please, exactly. please link my socials. I'd love to have a couple more, fo- a couple more followers. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, we'll make sure that happens. And we want to take this chance, guys, to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help our show continue to grow, get more amazing guests like Ernie Altbacker here to have these types of conversations with and give you funny moments to be able to listen to. So please subscribe. It helps out well more than we can tell you. And you're going to want to go check out Ernie's work. Keep an eye on him uh, through his socials. You can research him. Uh, Google is free. Use that. You'll be able to find out what he's working on next. And uh, yeah, you're going to enjoy catching up or keeping up with him rather but if for whatever reason you aren't happy with the content of our show today please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department the the man of mystery edward nigma yes this genius supervillain who developed a whole new identity so he could be taken more seriously by other criminals will review your submission examine your grammar for his psychological weaknesses and get back to you whenever he feels it is most convenient for him Or maybe he'll just leave you clues all over the city so that you can find them. He's crazy. Honestly, we have no idea what he'll really do. Oh, goodness. Thanks again, Ernie. (laughs) Thank you, Ernie. All right, guys. That's going to conclude us for the FSF podcast. Goodbye. Ciao. Bye. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of the FSF podcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please contact us by means of Twitter or Instagram using the handle at FSF Popcast. 
or go to www.fsfpopcast.com and click on the contact me link. Thanks again and hope you enjoyed the episode. Copyright 2023 FSF Popcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Popcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.